Well, this isn't a match day vlog. This is a bonus video. I hope you enjoy the extra videos that I'm putting up on the YouTube channel with people that I meet along the way, like Mark Riley, you're going to hear from now. He's a former Radio 1 disc jockey. These days he's on BBC at Six Music. Uh, and he's, of course, a big City fan. In a moment, he'll talk about David Silva and particularly his adventures uh, out in Spain and the surprising reaction he had to the the lack of idolisation of one David Silva. But first up, on the season 2019-2020, who's his Player of the Year? Yeah, I'd have to say Kevin De Bruyne, myself personally. Um, and they're all clichés, but the clichés because they're true, you know. I mean, he's just a joy to watch. And you can see what I really love about him is the fact that he does get annoyed on the pitch, you know. He kind of, he really does get narked. He will shout at people. He's got that captain role. He's got the captain in him. You can see that, and and I think we have missed that. We've missed that quite a lot. When Vinny wasn't playing, you could tell there was no kind of real lead on the pitch. Even when Kevin was there, he would still have a stand up row with another City player quite happily. But the kind of orchestration and the command, he didn't really have. But I think. I think that's coming now. I think that he's probably a bit too, I don't know him, makes it sound like I know him, but he's probably a little bit too humble to thinking around telling other people what to do. And, I, you know, it's a trait that I wish some other players had. Um, but he has, he's, he's got it. And you can tell that he really does understand the way that a team should work, you know. And I also think probably, I mean, like Roy Keane, you know, love him or loathe him. The weird thing about him is the fact that wherever he goes, he causes turmoil because he was a great footballer. And you can tell that he expects everybody to be able to play as good as him. Now, I don't think Kevin De Bruyne would have that in, in, in his locker because I think, again, I just think he's too too humble a guy. And I think he, I mean, I would imagine he feels blessed, you know, because he is just, he's got this natural talent. And, and um, yeah, the, the, the cliche again, a joy to watch, but, but he is so... I would have to say, yeah, Kevin, and and I expect he will. I expect he will soar. I, you know, I think for the next four years, five years, I think he's just going to be unbeatable, really. Obviously, it's been an unprecedented season the way it's it's been since the restart. From my personal point of view, as an obsessive match day fan, it's been heartbreaking not to be able to attend the games. What do you think, though, about the the transition of the football and right up to the derby match? It was in front of a crowd. Since then, it's been empty stadiums. Do you think that's affected the season? And what's your view of it all? Well, it couldn't be helped to begin with, I suppose, is the, uh, the, the starting base, because, you know, it wasn't done out of choice, this thing. But... I really, uh, it's a strange thing. If you had said like, you know, a year ago that you would be, be welcoming back football on the TV with no crowd and you couldn't go to the match, you would just think that what on earth could have led to that scenario? Um, but there we are. I mean, and, and so when it actually came back behind closed doors, I ended up like really having this... Um, it's the best way of putting it, really. I was just missing it so much, you know? It was just got to the point where I would take anything. And, uh, and one of the main kind of points of discussion behind the closed door scenario is whether you watch... <laughs> this is football supporters for you, but it's as to whether you watch it with the fake noise on, the fake crowd noise, or without. And I personally, I personally watch it with... Um, and I did, I did watch the first one, or some of the first one, without. And then I thought... This really reminds me of um, a scenario. So there was a guy called Malcolm Malk who used to um, uh, run the security at Carrington, which is just around the corner from where I live. And so whenever I fancied it, I'd get up in the morning. And at that point in time, I was, even then I was working nights, um, if you can call it work. And um, so I just think, yeah, I'm going to go to Carrington. So I'd flip over to Carrington and see Mal on the door, have a chat with him and he'd go, yeah, come in. And so I'd just be stood there watching the key. It was a Keegan era. And, uh, and the training did, uh, it consisted of them playing five a side against each other. And he wasn't a very good system because we weren't really very good for most of the time. But I got every week, two or three times if I wanted, I'd just go down and watch City play football against each other. And it was bizarre because, you know, obviously they weren't at all guarded. But beyond that, it was watching my heroes playing 
to nobody apart from me and perhaps four people behind a fence about 200 yards away. And it reminded me of that. It was just watching it with the sound down. Um, and so I do, and I know it's a split second late and I know it's not perfect, but it isn't perfect. So, um, and I know people are getting into a rouse about it, you know, as to whether you should or shouldn't, it doesn't matter, does it? But, um, I mean, the one good thing, the one thing that I've really enjoyed, I think probably the greatest thing to come out of this, um, the, the, uh, the lockdown closed doors um, scenario, is uh, Frank Lampard losing it with the Liverpool bench, because <laughs> you would never really have been able to hear that before. And uh, what he was saying was just brilliant. It just made me laugh. And of course, it wasn't aimed directly at Klopp. It was mainly as a system, wasn't it, as I understand it. Um, but that's brilliant. I absolutely love that. And I also love the fact that, um, yeah, I mean, Klopp did get annoyed at the fact that it continued afterwards. So, like, Klopp has set his own rules out, whereby he thinks that you should... It's all well and good doing it on the pitch, but afterwards you've got to forget it. Uh, and, like, Frank's got a lot to learn and all this kind of stuff. I don't think so. I think Frank Lampard knows what he's on about. Um, and he was just really narked, and it was great. And just seeing him giving the verbals, you know, <laughs> and that bit where he said, you've won your first title and you're bigging it up, you know, it's like, yeah, that, that's the best thing to come out of the, uh, <laughs> the behind closed doors thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, who knows when we're going to get back in? I mean, just because Boris Johnson tells you something's okay and safe to do, I wouldn't necessarily take him at his word. That's me being diplomatic. So if, you know, if Boris Johnson tells me it's all right to go and put my hand in a fire tomorrow, I'm not going to do it. So like everybody else, I'm just going to take it as it comes, you know, and see, see what transpires. But um, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, if you look at like yesterday, Trace, my wife and I, we went to the pub and sat outside and had some food. And it was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. You know, it's like the stuff that you take for granted and stuff. So, yeah, right, okay, but at least every other week, because we don't do many of the away matches. And so every other week, right, we've got the football. I'll, I'll take a night off work and make a real effort to go and see City or whatever. But it is part and parcel of your life. And now, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, talk about armchair. So I've got a chair at the back of the room. Um, and it's, so it's two rooms knocked into one. So I drag the chair from the back and sit in front of the TV like Father Jack. And that's just my assumed position, you know. So every time there's a match on, not even City, I've just been taking loads. I've not watched so much football in my life, I don't think. I drag the chair from the back of the room, plonk it in front of the uh, TV, pull a, a speaker from my hi-fi over, which is my little table, and I put a can on it, and I sit there, and I'm in situ. And that's become my ritual for this kind of lockdown. Um, and so I want that to end as soon as possible, but... You know, I mean, we'd made our minds up not to go to the Real Madrid match. And of course it was cancelled. But, you know, the night before with the Liverpool match and everything, you're thinking, oh God, why is this going ahead? You know, what, this seems crazy. And then you think, oh, if I don't go tomorrow night, that might be the last time I can go. But we had, we'd, we wrestled with it. We really did, you know, and we thought, no, it's probably not the right thing to do. And then of course, obviously everybody agreed because the match didn't happen. Um, so I'll I'll be I'll throw a street party when it's over. But for the time being, uh, I'll take it. I'll take <laughs> I'll take anything I'm given. You know. Then to the subject of David Silva, um, you're of an age to have remembered players from other eras as well. Um, I don't know if you saw Colin Bell playing and Francis Lee and all that era. Is David Silva the best player that's ever played for City from what you've seen? In a word, yes. I mean, I think it is deeply unfair to try and, and compare an athlete from today and a footballer from yesteryear because I think those are two relevant words. You know, I mean, like now you look at the diets and you look at the fitness regimes. And then if you consider at the other end of the scale, you know, the stories of Stan Bowles on his way to QPR and having three pints and going to the bookies and then playing. It's a different world, you know. So, I mean... If, even if you just physically look at, no offence, Francis, but Francis Lee and, <laughs> and David Silver or whoever, you know, it's just a, literally a different ball game. So you, I think it's impossible to compare them. But um, yeah, I mean, David Silver, all he kind of, you know, Merlin and all that kind of stuff, the magician and this, that and the other. But there hasn't been anybody like him, you know, and... And I do remember when the first season we were watching him and then, of course, he got 2011 and 2012. When 
for the first time really in a long, long time, perhaps the first time ever, if City went one down, you, you just look at each other and go, right, we're going to score now. And you could see that David Silva was pretty much at the heart of that because uh, he, he did something that I've never seen a City player do before, really. Not, certainly not without a plum. Would be if, particularly if we were one down, he'd get the ball and he would run for a bit and he'd stop and he'd look round. And then he get going again, you know, and you think, right, he's working something out here rather than just getting hold of it and tear arsing down the pitch and like being brilliant, whatever. He just stopped. And I was like, what's he doing? You know, he, he lost his way and he was just, and, and, and it was, it gave such a confidence, you know, and uh, yeah. And, and watching him play, it's just, it's, He's something else. He's, he's the greatest City's player. He's one of the greatest players in the, uh, ever to play in the Premiership, isn't he? And we went to, funnily enough, we watched the, um, the first leg of the Real Madrid match. We watched it in Gran Canaria. Um, and it was a, a mad week. The, um, COVID had kicked in in Tenerife, so people were a little bit paranoid about that. The same week that hotel went into lockdown. And we suffered a three-day sandstorm. It was... It was like biblical, you know, we just saw this haze in the sky and Trey said, what, what's going on there? And we went out, I don't know, the sea had kind of disappeared. It was like fog, but it obviously wasn't fog. And then within an hour, batting down the hatches and it really was, it was just a three day sandstorm. And funnily enough, we had to wear all the masks and everything, you know, the, like we did when we got back with COVID. Um, but walking around Gran Canaria, it didn't seem like David was particularly celebrated at all, you know, I, you would think that there would be there would be images in everywhere and shirts for sale with silver written on it, but there wasn't, and I found that uh, quite distressing actually. <laughs> you know, I mean, they haven't got that much to celebrate, so I think David Silver is, you know, it probably. Um, but yeah, to see him go, it will be like, it, and we can't even do it the same way. But I mean, I've seen David Silver play for the last time for Man City, which is heartbreaking. Um, but it is what it is, unless he changes his mind. Um, I would like to think that he's kind of like, you know, having not seen out his career properly at City, I wonder if he's having any second thoughts. You don't know where he lives, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you can go around and see him, just have a word. Uh, a polite word, obviously, but um, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be weird. It's like watching without Vinny. I mean, we know we know the, the impact that Vinny going uh, had on the club. And uh, I don't think, I, funnily enough, I don't think David going will have the same impact, but it will just seem strange with him not being there. My thanks to Hotclick Marketing for their support of this video. They are, of course, specialists in online marketing. Thanks very much to charleslouis.co.uk, who are chartered mortgage advisors. All the info is on the graphic. If you want to contact them, I'm sure they'd be delighted to help.